Hey, uh, g'day Richard, uh, thanks for being here with us today. Um, so can you start off by giving us uh, a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Hi, uh, so yeah, my name is Richard McDermott. I'm an astrophysicist, a researcher and academic from Macquarie University in Sydney. Uh, so I uh, teach and do research in astronomy um, and my area of research is around uh, how galaxies form and evolve over uh, the edge of the universe. Uh, within that, I look at the stellar, uh, the, the, the chemistry and the motions of stars, um, and a little bit about black holes. And I also uh, work a bit on uh, helping design and build new instruments for telescopes. Yeah, well, so you've got uh, many different hats that, that you wear. And um, so obviously, we're standing here right now at Siding Spring Observatory. Um, and I would love to, to hear a little bit about your role with the, with the Australian Dark Sky Alliance and, and what we're doing yeah, in that area. Yeah, certainly, certainly. So um, part of what I do is uh, I'm a, a founding board member for this Australasian Dark Sky Alliance. And so actually that, um, uh, that group actually has a, its basis here, it formed here at Siding Spring Observatory. Um, so uh, about four years ago, uh, we had a conference that was focusing on light pollution, uh, dark sky preservation, and everything that connects with that. And this was a really needed event because, um, you know, light pollution actually is more than just affecting astronomers' view of the night sky. Uh, it affects animals and plants. Uh, it is also affecting uh, people's personal connection with the night sky, which as an astronomer, um, I have a, a, you know, a, a real fascination with the night sky and uh, the idea that people may find it difficult or even impossible to, to experience the night sky fully is really important to me. Um, and if we're going to make any progress, we can't just complain about it. We have to bring on board the people who, um, who make the rules about lighting and who make the designs for lighting. Um, so if we're going to solve this problem, we all have to get together. So that was the idea of this, of this conference that we held just, just behind us here um, at the Siding Spring Observatory. And so this was uh, kind of a new area for me. I'm an you know, astrophysicist and, and we were hearing talks about spiders and how they react to light uh, from uh, people from the mining sector and the constraints that they have in this area and uh, people who want astrotourism businesses to come and, and help people experience the night sky. Um, and so it was a real mixture of people who hadn't really spoken to each other before. And so it was a great conference and of course great, great area to do it in where we're in um, a dark sky park, which I guess we'll talk about later. Um, but afterwards, you know, everyone goes back to their own uh, work and we thought, no, we've got to have something that, that persists, that, that carries on the work um, that we, and the ideas that we talked about all together. And so that's where the Australasian Dark Sky Alliance came from. So this is a registered charity um, and our board members span the range of fields that I just talked about. So we have representatives from ecology, from astronomy like myself, uh, small businesses who want to bring people into uh, dark sky locations, um, and uh, people from the lighting industry who are helping us design lights. Um, and you know, with all of this expertise, we can actually you know, speak to the broad range of, of areas that light pollution affects. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing there. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Um, and so you did mention it there, um, uh, the idea that Siding Spring is a dark sky park. Uh, and we did speak earlier in this course about light pollution and some of the effects that it's having on, on cultural knowledge as, as well as astronomy and wildlife and all of those sorts of things. So can you tell us what a dark sky park is and how it helps with this um, light pollution problem? Yes. So a dark sky park is uh, uh, an area, geographical area that's defined. Um, and in that area, you have, first of all, you have naturally a very pristine night sky uh, and nighttime environment. And then you also have measures in place to monitor the conditions there, the nighttime conditions, and protect the nighttime conditions that are there. Uh, typically that's done through ordinances or, or rules um, that affect how people um, can use lighting in that area and so that could be things like, you know, if you're going to, if there are people living in that area, uh, you know, the porch light or how they, they put a, a light on their, on, their, on their garden or garage, there'll be rules about how bright that can be, how often it can be on, the kind of light fixture that's involved. And that's a really important part of, of keeping a control on the lighting environment. Light pollution is one of those 
things that it's, it's, it's rarely one light source that's causing the problem. It's kind of uh, death by a thousand cuts. Um, it's very incremental and it creeps and creeps and creeps until suddenly it's a problem that's very hard to get a handle on. And so dark sky parks allow us to, you know, keep that control from the beginning and preserve those pristine conditions. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess uh, it's really important to understand how pervasive it is. Um, so we are here at Siding Spring, and even Siding Spring is affected by the light pollution from Sydney, for instance, which is 450 kilometres from where we're standing. And in an area where during the day, Sydney would have no effect or very little effect on Siding Spring Observatory, but we see that at a, at a research level that it has a, a, a very huge effect on the observatory at, no, at the night time. So. Yeah. It's really sort of mind-blowing to understand just how pervasive this problem can be. Correct, correct. Uh, yes, and you know, dark sky parks give us one control, but actually, as you say, you know, uh, light pollution can spill over such large areas um, that, that, they're, that that's a real threat to, to those uh, dark sky regions. So here at Siding Spring Observatory, you mentioned you know, this is an observatory. There are many telescopes here. Many uh, researchers use this facility every night. And uh, so Siding Spring Observ Observatory has special light guidelines um, that protect the immediate area, something like a 20 kilometer radius from the observatory. And then also uh, on a much larger scale, 200 kilometer radius. And then within a 200 kilometer radius of here, you span three different local councils. Uh, there's a number of towns, some of them, you know, a, a good size. And all of those people have to be on board with following these guidelines, otherwise it's meaningless. And, and that's a real challenge. So I'm also on the um, dark sky committee for the observatory. And that's a place where we bring in the planning department and the, the, the council representatives. We keep monitoring developments in this area because you know, there's a lot of uh, mining uh, facilities here which have gas flares uh, that have work at night happening. Uh, you know, you have a railway development coming that will have large, you know, loading areas that need lit at night. All of these things come to the observatory. They have to be consulted on those things and, and can raise objections and through, you know, reach, reach some kind of agreement around how lighting is controlled. But we have, there's a very special reason for that because we have these amazing telescopes. And what the Dark Sky Alliance would like is those kinds of processes in place in other regions where the night sky is also valuable for the other, uh, other areas, uh, be it ecology uh, or the cultural connection um, or you know, whatever. But that consultative process is a really good model for keeping those dark sky regions throughout the country, actually.